Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Altman. I have the distinct pleasure of chairing the steering committee for AML Matters. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time in Minneapolis, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, I also really love being in this building. It's very emotional for those of us who take care of folks with leukemia. Um, uh, so AML Matters is, stands for the multidisciplinary approach to testing, diagnosis, evaluation of risk, and personalized treatment selection. So essentially what we're going to do today is have an educational forum, a summit, to talk about the multidisciplinary approach to identifying patients, diagnosing them, trying to come up with the, an assessment of risk, and how, with all of that information, developing personalized treatment options. This is um, truly a multidisciplinary event. This is hosted by the American Society of Hematology, American Society of Clinical Pathology, the Oncology Nursing Society, the National Marrow Donor Program, or Be The Match, and the France Foundation, and there are representatives from each of those agencies here. I'd like to just point out a couple of individuals and thank them for their assistance in putting together this large um, program. I'd like to point out Michelle Martin, who is the Grants Project Manager of ACP, Julie Orlando Castro, who's the Director of Education at ASH, American no or Amanda Noe, who is the Manager of Medical Education at the France Foundation, and Wendy Scales, who's the Medical Director at the France Foundation. Thank you all for your support with us. And finally, I'd like to thank um, Celgin Corporation for an independent educational grant so we can conduct this programming. There'll be photography throughout. And we have a number of overreaching goals that you can look at. Briefly, I'll run through the agenda. Um, we're currently doing welcome introductions and summit overview. We will move directly into the tumor board presentation. There will be a very short break when we will go into small breakout rotations. You will each experience each of these sessions. There are small um, educational, um, essentially, pieces that we will go through, um, and you will rotate as a group, and the faculty members will stay, and so all of you will have an experience, uh, be able to experience each of the four breakout sessions. After lunch, we will reconvene with problem-based learning workshop. Um, at, you will be seated um, in the groups where you are at the tables, and you will each be assigned a case where you will work through um, to uh, understand what the case is and develop a case presentation that one member of your group will then present back to the entire group of us. Um, and then we'll have a wrap up. So I'd like to introduce our, our esteemed faculty. Um, I will allow them to introduce themselves, starting with Arif. Thank you. My name is Arif Alcali. I'm one of the hematologists at Mayo Clinic. Hi, I'm Kathleen Wiley. I'm a clinical nurse specialist with the Oncology Nursing Society. Um, prior to that, I was a clinical nurse specialist on the bone marrow transplant unit at the hospital at the University of Penn. Excited to be here. Uh, I'm Rob Surgeon. I'm a hematopathologist, and uh, I work at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. I'm Marty Tallman from the Leukemia Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. I'm Anne Marie Blog. Mm -hmm. I direct the Clinical Study Genetics Laboratory at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. And Linda Burns, you met me um, before I came to NMDP a couple years ago. I was a transplant physician in the adult BMT program, University of Minnesota. I want to extend a special welcome to the University of Minnesota colleagues here today. Great, thank you. Our disclosures are available at your seats, and if there are any questions, please go ahead and ask us. Um, in addition, there will be um, agents that we discuss throughout the course of our discussion that are off-label, um, and we will try to point those out through the course of discussion, but if there are any questions about any of the agents that we're utilizing, please let us know. I'd like to point out that a couple of members of our steering committee are not here today. Um, Drs. Heidi Kleppen um, and Dr. Bruno Medeiros are not here, but they have been instrumental in putting together the materials for these sessions. So we introduced ourselves, but I don't think that really gives you a good sense of kind of who we are as people. I'm hoping that um, a funny icebreaker might help get you guys to know us a little bit better. 
Um, so I will ask our faculty members what something interesting and unique or funny that has happened recently to them. Um, I guess in the spirit of leadership, um, as embarrassed as I am, I should go ahead and start. Um, so I have three children. Um, my oldest is 13, almost 14, um, and I, my youngest is turning three today. Um, and I have one somewhere in between. So I think you can kind of imagine what dinner table conversation is around the house. I have you know, my 13 and 11 year old daughters talking about Snapchat, Instagram, um, social media, and um, with my oldest who is preparing for high school. Whereas the youngest um, is, I'm trying to you know, get out of diapers. So you can imagine the kind of the conversation of um, what's going on in the world of the world in general and the world of a 13 and 11 year old. And in the midst of conversation, someone's saying, mommy, I have to go pee pee. Mm -hmm. So that is a glimpse into what life in the Altman household is like. I didn't know that I was going to talk about this. But <laughs> Change the icebreaker, I would just like to say. <laughs> <laughs> but it was um, something from yesterday. Um, I think I'm a skillful driver. Oh, no. We have three people from Rochester, Minnesota. Oh. So it usually starts by a question saying, do you drive a red car? And the next I say, why? And then people say, you almost ran me over yesterday. <laughs> 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 and it was so bad that yesterday I offered a ride for a couple of my colleagues and they said, no, thank you. And I was like, <laughs> did my fame become national? <laughs> well, I'm wishing I took you up on it because I got some blisters on my feet walking. <laughs> um, so um, I also have three kids, a 10-year-old girl, a 6-year-old girl, and a 2-and-a-half-year-old boy. And I have to say, I'm impressed there are even dinner conversations because it's a <laughs> feat for us to all sit down. Um, so they keep me on my toes. 10-year-old girl wants to be a uh, professional goalie for the U.S. soccer team. Yes. Yeah, I'm not convinced, but <laughs> we'll see. Um, my six-year-old is convinced that she is Wonder Woman. We went to see the movie. She wore the costume. She took the lasso, the whole nine yards. Um, and my two-and-a-half-year-old, if I can just <laughs> get him out of diapers, I'll be happy. But um, So they keep me on my toes. Um, so I have to say, when they said, do you want to come to Minneapolis and do this talk? <laughs> yes. I would be happy to spend a night in a quiet hotel room. Um, so, But happy to be here um, and excited to work with all of you. So I, um, mine is sort of a, an aspect about myself, a hobby I have. Um, I'm a generally very mild-mannered person. Um, but I'm a competitive bridge player, actually. And that means literally I play, I, I, I play bridge every week at a, at a bridge club um, with a partner. We have a regular partnership. I've flown to bridge conventions, not recently. Um, and uh, although I'm very mild-mannered, I'm a real shark at the bridge table. <laughs> very tough to my opponent, so. I <clears throat> recently returned from a meeting at the Chinese Society of Hematology in uh, Harbin, China. And at the, I'm kosher, so I don't eat meat outside unless it's kosher meat. And my friend Mark Levis, who many of us know, told me that United Airlines has tomato soup and grilled cheese on every long distance flight. So I get on this long flight on the way back from Beijing, and I say to the flight attendant, she says, what would you like? And they offer salmon, and they offer all kinds of things. I said, I'm curious. My friend says to me that you always have tomato soup and grilled cheese. So we do, and I said, I'm just curious, is the tomato soup have a meat base? She gave me sort of a funny look, like, you know, there's more important things to do. She said, I don't know, so I didn't eat it. And I got home, and my wife and I were hysterical after I got home. I, I, she just said, we ought to call United and call the kitchen and find out if the tomato soup has a meat base. <laughs> so I made several phone calls, and it, yes, I actually did, and you can't, but you can't get to find out. If you, you can't, you can't find, so my wife said to me, you should, I said, I'm going to try to reach the CEO's office for fun. Oh my, God. <laughs> my wife said, I told her, she said, he's worried about Dr. Dow being dragged off the plane, and, <laughs> the and some guy is trying to find out if the tomato <laughs> So I, it remains, it will remain an enigma to me. If 
if anyone finds out, <laughs> what Marty know? Um, my son, we'll talk about children. My son is 30. He's a road warrior. He works for an IT company. If anybody's seen the movie Up in the Air, where there's yeah. that packing scene in the beginning of the movie, that's, that's his life. So imagine me yesterday flying from Buffalo through O'Hare onto Minneapolis. He was in Minneapolis on business, flying through O'Hare back down to Raleigh, Durham. 15 minutes in the airport, we got a chance to meet and talk as we both headed in opposite directions. So that was, that was a lot of fun. So the icebreaker was supposed to be, <laughs> tell about an unknown fact, something that people don't know about you. So I think most people know that I grew up on a big farm uh, in north central Missouri. And I think most people don't know that I was the 1971 pork queen of Lynn County, Missouri. <laughs> and I spent a year of my life talking about hogs. Oh. <laughs> That's right. hogs? Ask me anything. You get tired of AML? I'm your girl today. So hopefully you have a better sense of a little bit of information about us. I would like to go ahead and move right into the tumor board. So we're confronted with a 70-year-old woman who presented to her primary care physician with progressive fatigue and dyspnea and exertion, which had progressed over the ensuing month. She denied chest discomfort, lower extremity swelling, fevers, or, or symptoms of bleeding. In review of systems, there were no other pertinent identifiers. Her past medical history is notable for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and arthritis. Current medications are listed, hydrochlorothiazide, losartan, rosuvastatin, and metformin. She has a notable family history for prostate cancer, coronary artery disease, and diabetes. She's a retired OBGYN, married. She lives close to the academic medical center where you're seeing her. She has two adult children, and for fun and recreation, she likes to play golf. On exam, she was um, afebrile, heart rate in the 90s, blood pressure about 140 over 90, satting 95% on room air. She just appeared a little nervous coming to see you as an oncologist, hematologist. And on, ex on exam, you noted conjunctival pallor, some bruising on her extremities, and a soft systolic murmur that she didn't recognize that she had had previously. Her heart rate was regular, her lungs were clear. Her abdominal exam was normal with no palpable organomegaly, no lymphadenopathy, and her neurologic exam was normal, non-focal. Her Karnofsky performance status was 80. You drew some labs due to the concern for the pallor and recognized a white blood cell count of 11.9 with an absolute neutrophil count of 1.1. Her hemoglobin was seven and her platelets were 36,000. Comprehensive metabolic panel revealed a creatinine of 1.1, elevated AST and ALT with a normal bilirubin, slightly elevated LDH. Her albumin was low at 2.8 normal uric acid and normal fibrinogen. So Arif, could you do me a favor please and summarize oh, the case in just one moment? There's a question that I wanna ask the audience first. Um, would, and, will you have um, a, the audience response system keypads in front of you? And I would like you all to go ahead and answer this question for us. The question is, would you like to see the full white blood cell count differential? We're starting with an easy one. It's, it's going to get harder. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or just move on and move on to your next patient. And leave a couple of moments more. OK. Hmm. It's counting. Okay, sorry. Six, Six more seconds, so you can still bid if you would like. Hmm. I know you're all waiting in suspense. 
Ah, so someone did not want to see the full white blood cell count differential, perhaps because they wanted to get to their golf game. Um, but I would like to ask um, RF if you could go ahead and summarize the case and your comments on the white blood cell count differential. Um, I think I just took a few, a few, a few notes, and you can be as detailed as you want. But basically, age is seventy uh, for the golfers. She plays golf, which is important. Actually, it means that she's active. She has a good performance status. Just knowing that, I usually tend to not judge patients on the way I look. I see them the day of the visit. So you want to know, like what Jessica mentioned, the history. How active was she? a month ago and all of that. It's very important. Um, she does have some comorbidities, although there was nothing major like a heart attack, for example, chronic kidneys, but she has other things like diabetes, and hypolipidemia, nothing major, but for a 70 year old, things like that. Her weight count was uh, 11,000, so there is, it's not that increased. You can think that there is beginning of growing up, proliferation there. Um, I think the neutrophils were 1,000. Mm -hmm, correct. Oh, the neutrophils like that. So the neutrophils are a bit low, which is classic, something wrong is going on. And you can see that what always I look at, especially if you are working in a non-university center, is, is others. Never let others on the NCBC fool you, because you need to know what are they. So if you look at this 10% neutrophils, there's a lot, a huge decrease in the neutrophils, which should be at least 60-70%. The lymphocytes are probably just normal, the mouse has a bit elevated, it was less than 10%. But remember, the others, if you have a machine in your office that says others, you need to know what are those others. Great. Does anyone have any questions about the white blood cell count differential? Any questions? We're going to spend some more time trying to figure out what those others are. Next question that I have for all of you is what additional information would you like in your evaluation of this patient? Let's go ahead and answer your keypads. <coughs> Wonderful. Sorry, won't let me advance after, until a certain amount of time. I apologize. And we all answered. This is always so hard when things don't work. Oops. Sorry, we here we go. Great. Rob, do you think you could comment on the audience's selections? Yeah, so it looks like uh, people either said all of the above or just the smear review. And um, I think it's helpful to have some of the other information, but I think, as Arif was saying, the others, I think, are the main. She's markedly intrapenic. She is anemic, I guess. But um, we need to see what the I think the most important thing is the review of the smear to see what these other cells are. Um, I think RBC indices in a situation like this, um, it's not only anemia. Um, again, it might give you some information if the patient's macrocytic. But I think uh, the main issue here is what the other cells on the smear are and finding out. So I would say the most important would be the smear review. But of course, other information could perhaps impact the way you think about it. If she has macrocytosis, you might wonder about a prior MDS or something like that. But I think smear review is the most important thing. Great. One other thing is some of the uh, local machines will say MID, like mixed size or something. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the way, in terms of other cells, I know different labs have different ways of handling this. Machines sometimes say, yeah, mid-level cells. Um, but often others are, are when a, a technologist has, has done a differential and can't, isn't sure exactly what the cells are. We have a policy in our laboratory. If, even if the, the technologist thinks they might be blast, they usually put them in the other category until that is confirmed by a pathologist. Um, some places I know suppress the differential until it's been reviewed if there's a question of new blasts. But clearly others is a red flag if there's some unidentified cells. Sometimes others, when we look at it, we look 
You decide they're just reactive atypical lymphocytes, or maybe the patient has a history of lymphoma, they're circulating lymphoma. So it doesn't mean they're definitely blast. They're just cells that are not readily identifiable and suggest there might be, a, might be an abnormality in the, in, the, in the white cells. And for those who asked for the red blood cell indices, what does this information tell us, Rob? I think it, it doesn't tell us a whole lot here. I mean, the RDW is increased, which is sort of nonspecific. The patient is not macrocytic. I think it, in this case, it doesn't really help us further narrow down what might be going on in this particular situation. So it appears the patient has a normocytic anemia. Right. We're not able, that in of itself doesn't provide further right. information. Well, what about the peripheral blood smear? Could you interpret so this, that for us? In this um, sort of low power view of the peripheral smear, you can see what these other cells are. And I think at this magnification, um, I think we worry they could be immature cells like blast. Um, we see cells that are, are large. They have abundant pale cytoplasm. They have sort of irregular nuclei. And just speaking in a generic sense, some cells might could they be atypical lymphocytes? Could the patient have a viral infection? Could they be monocytes? Could this patient have CMML? But the nuclear features at this magnification so far look somewhat immature, and I'd worry that they could be uh, monocytic blasts. I think that's something I'd worry about. Um, so again, what would have happened in our lab is these others, we would be reviewing the smear, we'd be looking at it, these would be going through our mind as we look at the smear, trying to figure out what these cells are. Is there anything else to note on the smear other than the, the obvious striking white cells? Any comments on the, the platelets or the red cells? Not yeah, it's that. in a bit of a thin area of the smear, so the red cell morphology is, I think, a little hard to interpret in that area. I think the white cells visualize well here. So I think in this smear, I wouldn't really comment on the red cells. Um, there's only platelets present, um, but I think in this case, we're, we're focused really on trying to figure out what these other cells are. Just one question, Rob. What are the features of the nucleus you said suggest immaturity? So I think we'll see that better in the next slide, but looking here, um, the chromatin is quite fine. It's not, it's not very condensed. I think that's the most important thing. Blasts come in many different flavors. Some have nucleoli, some don't. You know, some have very scant cytoplasm, some have abundant cytoplasm. The most helpful thing in identifying a true blast versus other abnormal or reactive cells that may circulate that may mimic blasts is, I think, the, the chromatin quality. And that you really have to go on high magnification to be, to be sure about. Why don't we go ahead and do that and take a look at a higher magnification? Does that confirm your suspicion? I think that helps. And this also, we're in a better area of the smear here where you can see the red cells have central pallor. I think the red cells look OK. Um, these cells in this area, um, and that also brings up a point when you're looking at a smear, you have to go find a good area where the cells display, display well. Um, these cells have cytoplasm that suggests perhaps monocytic features. They have vacuoles. They have kind of a, a dirty-looking cytoplasm that, that suggests perhaps they're, they're in the monocytic lineage. But the nucleus is not that of a mature monocyte. The NC ratio is high, and they have features of immaturity. The chromatin is finely dispersed. The nuclei has a little crease in it. And these cells, to me, look like, like promonocytes, which are, which are blast equivalents. So when I see these now, I worry that these are basically cells from an acute leukemia with monocytic differentiation. Um, I think that helps confirm what these other cells are. I don't think they're atypical lymphocytes. The nuclei are too irregular, and the chromatin is too fine, and the cytoplasm isn't really right for that. I think that would have been on the differential of the cells, maybe on lower power. Um, I also want to note there was a lymphocytosis, if, if you'll recall. And I think many of the cells that were perhaps called maybe atypical lymphocytes might actually be some of these, these blast cells. Sometimes monoblasts or promonocytes could be confused with atypical lymphocytes. Um, so one might wonder if that was happening when the, the smear was being counted initially. So potentially that blast percentage includes the other cells and could, many of those lymphs because we're it seeing... It could be higher than that. That's right, right. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions about the interpretation of the peripheral blood smear? The one thing I always see, even pathologist colleagues have a problem with, is monocytes versus promonocytes versus monoblast. I think, tip. yes, that's a very interesting point. I think that's a very difficult and controversial area. You know, promonocytes are considered blast equivalents. They're counted together with the blast that are arriving at, you know, 20% when we diagnose the AML. And we actually did a study on this with a, with a bone marrow group I'm involved with. And it's, it's, it can be an area of poor reproducibility, even among expert hematopathologists. I think one thing you have to have high quality smears where you can visualize the cells well. And this is, I think, shows an excellent image of that. Um, so I think it can be problematic. Another issue that can come up, not so much in this case, because I think these cells are overly immature, but 
when you have a monocyte leukemia, you can have more mature monocytes circulating in the blood, so you can see what looks deceptively like a mature monocytosis, and the marrow can have predominantly pro-monocytes. So that's the thing you have to worry about when you have what even looks like a mature monocytosis. But you're right, it is an area of some morphologic, um, there could be sometimes some subjectivity to that. Okay. Go ahead and um, inter- summarize where we are here with the case. Sure. It's again uh, 70 year old and uh, looks like to do a good performance task. Um, she's got a few comorbidities, but not many. No, no major organ dysfunction. She has some leukocytosis. Doesn't seem to be terrible. I think we have time to get some more data to make the right decision. Like the white compass, for example, 150, where we need to do major decisions. Great. So, based on the information that you have thus far, I would like to ask everyone what are your next steps for this patient? Remember, um, she did have abnormal liver function tests. So, A, CT scan, uh, B, ultrasound of the abdomen, C, bone marrow aspirin biopsy, or D, any further antibody immunotype factors given the history of record. either from the bone marrow biopsy or in general in evaluating this patient with suspected acute myeloid leukemia. Anyone from table A, what studies would you recommend at this point? (laughs) Thank you, Mike. What would you want? (laughs) There we go. Uh, probably a comprehensive uh, flow cytometry analysis. And depending on that flow analysis, I might use some cytochemical stains like a, a nonspecific esterase just to kind of confirm monocytic lineage. Uh, G-bands, uh, some people reflex to fish, but you can get a lot of things by G-bands, but that's not my expertise, as well as uh, probably uh, some molecular studies, including NPM1 and FLT3. Great, thank you. Is there anything else anyone else would like to add? Any other information about the patient as we're starting a road on thinking about eventual therapies? Yeah, go ahead. Why? Great. Thank you. I think uh, it would be helpful to see the old, any old previous lab of CBC, you know, just see evolution of the disease per se. Anyone else? Table A's really got all the ideas, you guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Excellent. <laughs> and why? Uh, in the event that you'd be considering a bone marrow transplant while there while there's cells and because you are at the NMDP be the match. Yes, and then I have one question. Sure. It, it used to be said that when there's a lot of high burden of blast, that HLA typing was not so easy. Is, is there any truth to that? Do you know? I don't know. Does anybody know? I've never heard that before. Certainly, we want to do a, well, certainly want to do HLA typing before we start any kind of induction mm-hmm. therapy. Um, but Nellie, you just yeah. Regardless of the percentage. Well, of count. Yeah, I've never had any difficulties. Yeah. 
how about the other way? Is it like, you know, what is the minimum white cells that you would like or, you know, to, to run HLA? I've never had any difficulty regardless. Have, have you? I mean, have what, you, you know, with the elderly ones, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 white count, mm -hmm. we've had some no, no, no answers from that. Hmm. So HLA typing is moving to next generation sequencing, which may help as well. So it's on the horizon. So I think that it will not be a problem. So what I would su suggest and what the standard recommendation is that for any patient that you suspect that has AML, they need to have HLA typing done at time of diagnosis and you need to do it before the induction therapy. So that's part of that, that you do need you know, some minimum white cells, but typically even at diagnosis you'll have enough and with NGS it won't be a problem at all. Yes. Are there other methods of doing HLA typing other than sending peripheral blood? For instance, if someone is referred to you after they've received induction chemotherapy and their counts are low, let's say they're at an outside hospital and they come and they have a white count of 0.1. You know, I think it's typically done on peripheral blood, but it can be done also on um, buccal smears. Yeah. So that's how we identify donors. You don't need peripheral blood. So you can really just do it with a swab as well. So there are other methods of doing that. Yeah, great. Linda, other than what was mentioned by the audience, um, are there any additional studies you'd recommend at this time? So what I've heard uh, from the audience is that our hematopathologists would like comprehensive flow. But I really appreciate Mike, you telling us about what studies that you might think about in terms of a, a bone marrow. So if you are going to do the bone marrow aspirin biopsy and the vast majority if you said that was your next step, then you need to be thinking, what am I going to order? And I think that one thing I would mention that not only as you as the clinician, but I would urge you to work very closely with your hematopathologist, your cytogeneticist. They're there and they are experts, as you've, as you've just heard. They, they can really help guide you regarding the testing. Um, cytogenetics versus when do you go ahead and do fish or do you start with G banding? We've had a little bit of discussion about HLA typing, and I like the idea that starting to think ahead, if you feel that this patient most likely has acute leukemia, what other things can you be doing? Because you really don't want to waste time. And are there things that you can do to make sure that your, your patient is, one, emotionally prepared for a diagnosis, their family? This is a very critical time for them. So I think you need to involve the entire multidisciplinary team, not be thinking just as the doctor, but who else needs to be involved in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, that we mentioned an echocardiogram, to be thinking ahead, what is the next step for your patient and would that be an anthracycline-based chemotherapy? Um, are you going to need uh, central line access? Are you going to need to evaluate the liver function test to make sure that there isn't any other underlying infection or problem so that you really understand the total uh, patient as you're starting to think about uh, treatment options? Because you're starting now to narrow down a little bit. You have a pretty strong suspicion just by looking at the peripheral blood smear uh, and getting ready for the bone marrow that uh, what is your next step for this patient? Can I mention one other Morning. possibility? Yes, and that is um, we try to put everyone that we can on a clinical trial. Many clinical trials require a consent to be signed before yes. the bone marrow, so you don't have to repeat it three days later for special uh -huh. studies. Mm -hmm. So we always encourage uh, the faculty to see what studies might be available. If it is one, it often is the case they need research bloods that you have to sign consent before the marrow, that we have them sign all the consent forms before the marrow. Mm -hmm. Very good point. So one thing we do want to, as a take-home message today, is that clinical trials should always be number one and to be thinking about what trials your patient is eligible for. And that's a really good point, Marty, of, of that obtaining consent prior to any bone marrow aspiration biopsy and to look what uh, additional testing is needed. We've, we've had patients yeah. where they do the, everyone is quick to do the bone marrow. They send right. all the sophisticated studies. They're eligible for a study. Then you have to tell the patient, I know I did a bone marrow yesterday, but I have to do another one. And there's not much worse than that. And somebody wants central collection and yeah. review of specimens. So, yeah, there's nothing worse than that. That's why you send, oh, I, I, my I mouth is going to give me in trouble. Some the, the medical student who's in. Although, of course, flow will be done in the yeah. bone marrow, and a bone marrow needs to be done to, to confirm the AML is required in many of the clinical trials as well. Often, we will send flow in the peripheral blood, blood before the bone marrow is done to have a sense. First of all, in this case, it, they don't, the blasts don't really look lymphoid, but often you don't know if it's ALL or AML, so it gives you a sense of what trials the patient may be eligible mm -hmm. for. So when you do the marrow, you already have a sense it's going to be AML or ALL. So often, we will send flow in the blood, and of course, the same blast circulating in the blood is in the marrow. And, and 
in many, not all cases necessary, you can have a leukemic leukemia sometimes. So that'll give you a sense right away what, what, what type of leukemia you might be dealing with before you do the marrow already. I think that's another good reminder of the importance in communication between the clinical and the laboratory colleagues and saying, you know, calling, if you're a clinician calling your laboratory colleague and say, hey, I have this patient with acute leukemia, what do you think it is by reviewing the peripheral blood so I know what studies to send? from the mm -hmm. bone marrow. And also, all I think many hospital systems are different. It depends where you are, who directs the testing from the bone marrow. So at my center, um, as the clinician, I order which testing I want, but there are some centers where the pathologist, after review of the material, is the one who's responsible for sending, ensuring cytogenetics and appropriate molecular studies are sent. Right. In our institution, it's often both the clinicians will order, but often if I feel there's a test that should have been ordered that isn't, I'll call the clinician and discuss it with them. You know, sometimes, you know, might be maybe suspecting a patient's pancytopenic, they might be thinking of classic anemia, and then the marrow's done and there's all these blasts, so, so we can sit. So it's a conversation, I think, between the two services, and that communication, I think, can really help ensure that the correct tests are done in a timely fashion. I wonder if a uh, question to Jessica and Marnie. The problem is with, with us, like, you know, as university hospitals, when you get a patient from smaller hospital, did a bone marrow, what, what would you do? I mean, you're not going to go on trial, for example. Do you wait for the slides to be come back? Do you repeat the bone marrow? It's always a problem. You get transferred a Friday night, no slides, <laughs> that's most AML. <laughs> we suffer from that. I'm sure you I can. I never have experienced Never. <laughs> We, we end up almost always in the doctor the bone marrow. We sometimes tell the patient, you know, we can get the bone marrow slides within a day or two. But it often is hard to get them within a day or two. And often the outside institution says they send cytogenetics and with special studies. We find out either they didn't or they didn't send enough or something to result properly. So we, I mean, we always tell patients, I know you just had a bone marrow three days ago, but we need another one. And most patients don't object. The same issue. Whenever I think I'm not going to repeat the bone marrow, I'm trying not to. Invariably, a couple of days pass, and I'm becoming more anxious. The patient's becoming more anxious, and we end up repeating the marrow. We want to ensure that all the appropriate studies are done. It's our one time to get all that information. I was curious about um, how urgent treatment is. Certainly, if you're suspecting acute promyositic AML NOS category. Uh, in the AML NOS category, um, what factors are you using to determine this is a Saturday morning and we're getting these calls from the lab and there's concern for AML and do transfer? And, uh, I'll make a couple of comments and Jessica and I know that Arif can make some comments too. I always, except for APL, which I agree with you is a true medical emergency, I, I usually don't think of AML as a true emergency. Now, someone comes in with a white cut of 400,000, that's different, but as you said, NOS, uh, garden variety AML, I, I think of it as sort of a subacute emergency. And Linda made a good point. Patients, we need to prepare them. We need to make the accurate diagnosis and send, send the special studies. You need to prepare them psychologically mm -hmm. and emotionally. We always have a family conference before we start any therapy that may last 15 minutes or may last an hour and a half where the patient, the partner, if they have a partner, any family member they want present, but we sit down and go over all the details. So we, uh, we uh, end up usually not starting within a day or two, and uh, it's usually three or four days later by the time uh, all the material is back and, and uh, hopefully they're on the some, one study or another. So I, I think APL, of course, is a true emergency. Hyperleukocytosis is an emergency. Uh, but in general, other than that, I think the patient and the family need time to be prepared. I think that's a really good point, Marty. At least when, when I was growing up, I mean, AML was, <gasps> you know, you, know, you got to do something really fast. Do you call in him, him path to, to help you process a bone marrow in the middle of the night? Or, or, is, or is Monday okay? And so I think we are changing a little bit and for a good thing about thinking about clinical trials and which specimens we really need and those type of things. So. Uh, I, I think that's changing and in a good way. I agree completely. In addition to clinical trials, it's also very helpful to have that additional disease information. So we can get the patient 
characteristics quickly as we're interacting with patients. But the other thing that helps us formulate decision making are the disease biology, the disease characteristics. And if this patient um, had favorable features, we would be thinking about one thing in terms of treatment versus if the disease biology, if the disease is not expected to be sensitive to chemotherapy, we may be thinking about additional treatment options and additional clinical trials. So collecting that information, I think, is critical. Certainly, in, in full disclosure, it's not surprising that I would treat and assess my patients the way that Marty does as he has trained me. So I'm not surprised that I think similarly. Tricky question, and because I think we, I agree with all of you. I mean, it's really that you will have to make a decision right that moment. This patient does not need anything. If we make the white count 60, 70,000, she probably needs hydrea by your time. The problem is, what if you get a patient with 100,000 or 200,000? You can do pharesis, but the problem when you get a crashing patient, that's where it becomes very, very tough. Crashing patient, Friday night, your facility does not have a pathologist on the weekend. You know, and it's true, even some facilities on Sunday, it's not easy to get a pathologist. Then you have to make that decision, am I gonna treat or not? In that case, I give a gram or half a gram of ARC. It doesn't matter whether it's ALL or AML, it's gonna work. But you better th know that this is acute leukemia, <laughs> otherwise you're giving it without knowing. So, tricky question in general. But in the last, for example, eight years, I've never had to do this blindly without a pathology confirmation of flow or anything like that. So Jessica and Marty, what is the minimal uh, NGS panel that you order? Uh, do you limit it to NPM, FLIT3, and CBP, or are you ordering more Maybe we should go than, ahead. than I, that? I think we are going, we're going to answer that question. Is that okay if we table that for a moment? Okay. I have uh, one other question. When you don't know between APL and when you don't know between APL and AML um, at the university, we've been seeing a few patients in that situation where they're um, starting ATRA. Is there much risk with that? I'd say there is almost no risk, risk. and the potential to help a patient is, yeah. mm -hmm. is great. So never be shy to start ATRA. And I also want to say as a pathologist, you know, often APL patients can present classically with DIC, but they may present without any obvious DIC, and it's up to the pathologist, it can morphologically be APL. So I think pathologists should have a very low threshold, and I certainly, I don't mind if I say, you know, this could be APL, and they start out and ends up not being APL. I'd rather have that happen than this one that slips through, and then they don't give after when they should. So I think that's one other advantage of sending flow on the blood, or say doing an NSC, because you can then quickly, you know, there's a particular flow pattern of APL that can help you, or that say that something's not going to be APL and takes the pressure off. So I think um, involving the pathologist in that conversation up front as to whether it could be APL or not, I think it's helpful, even if clinically there's no obvious suspicion that it's APL. Your cytogenetics laboratory can help you out with that as well. Um, we have some rapid uh, fish hybridization buffers now that can allow us to give you an answer in a couple of hours. So let's go ahead and summarize our considerations in working up a patient. Um, Rob, if you could lead us through this. So um, as we discussed, uh, doing a bone marrow is important. Um, and I think both an aspirin and a biopsy should be performed. Um, how many of the hematologists, when you're diagnosing new APML, do you always do a biopsy? Do any of you not do a biopsy because it's not necessary? Or? I think it's important because occasionally you may have a dry tap or a compromised aspirate and the biopsy can then be essential in confirming the, the, the blast phenotype because you can do immunostains. Immunotype by cytometry has been mentioned. Cytogenetics um, should be performed by, by G-banding, classic carrier type. And the question comes up, is um, fish testing necessary? And I don't know if Anne-Marie wants to comment on that aspect. Um, the question that was just raised, if you have a distinct suspicion of a particular rearrangement, that could be confirmed by fish. But really, to see your whole genomic complexity, you really need to do a, a complete chromosome analysis. So that, that would be your first step, unless, of course, you have you know, a very specific question that needs to be answered. Because remember, FISH only answers the question of presence or absence of that particular abnormality. 
And then the molecular studies, as has been mentioned, what are the minimal requirements? I think we're, I think we're going to be discussing that in, in more detail. But as an example, let's say your flow tells you it's ALL, then you, of course, don't need to send the FLT3 NPM1 and all that. So that's why, again, having an idea when you're going into doing the marrow, what, what type of leukemia it might be can be helpful in guiding which test to send. But I believe we'll be talking a little more about the molecular testing and the approaches and which ones to do um, later. So there are, what are the, the core um, molecular studies that every right. AML patient should have? So every AML patient to do, prop, to do the WHO classification, you have to have NPM1 mutation sent, CBP alpha mutation sent, and the new WHO AML with RUNX1 mutation is a new provisional entity, so that should sent, be sent if you want to do the WHO classification. Um, and um, FLT3, I think, in many, you know, essentially all leukemia guidelines should also be sent, uh, assessed for FLT3 ITD. So those are really the main ones that I think should be sent in all patients. Okay. okay. And then the kit mutation, we'll talk about later, kit mutation, because it could be relevant in patients who have core binding factor AMLs. Um, so those, I think, should be included. Um, one thing that can happen is if, if you're sending something for any molecular testing, even if you don't, even if you do a limited test, of course the lab will save the DNA. So if you think about a, a study that should be done later, say p53, you suspect there's a complex carrier type, that can you often be added on as an additional mutation test later, um, because the lab will have the DNA. Um, I think all labs would keep that and could do it later. Right, so back to our patient, he indeed had, she, sorry, um, had a bone marrow biopsy. And Rob, could you interpret yeah, the we'll, core biopsy for us? We'll talk about the core biopsy. He asked, they, they both were done. So you can see this biopsy, just giving a sense, it's, it's very hypercellular for the patient's age. Um, there's only a couple of fat cells, so it's very hypercellular. And often, uh, when we look at the bone marrow biopsy, as well as the aspirates, what you don't see that's as important as what you do see. And we don't see neutrophils. We don't see very many maturing erythroids. There are some small, um, maybe some small megakaryocytes with hypolobated nuclei in the background. Um, but it basically looks like a lot of blasts. Um, and we'll go to the aspirate smear next. A couple of images of the aspirate smear. So I think similar cells to what we were seeing in the purple blood, um, very irregular nuclei, vacuoles. These are uh, monocytic cells. Um, and they look primitive and look, again, like, like promonocytes and monoblasts. In the next slide, we have a few images. There are some dysplastic cells in the background. This is a dysplastic erythroid. Um, there's maybe some hypogranulation of some myeloid cells. One thing when we look, again, when we all just look at the bone marrow, we're also looking at the background elements as well because there is um, the sensitivity of AML of MDS-related changes that often has significant background dysplasia. In this case, again, from this field, I can't tell. There are plenty of normal cells, too. You have to see 50% dysplastic cells, which is a pretty high threshold. And I don't think we reach that in this case, at least from these uh, fields. Great. So a question for all of us, which of the following is true concerning standard cytogenetic testing or conventional karyotyping? and have you help walk us through okay. this question. I'm going to wait for the... Uh, the response. polling is closed. It's just not letting me oh, okay. show. Okay. In order to do a good chromosome analysis, you're only as good as the material okay. that's provided to you. So it needs to come to the laboratory in a timely manner. Uh, we request that it not be refrigerated because we're relying on the cell's innate ability to divide in culture. So the cells have to go through at least one division in order to be able to see the chromosomes. And I see that... Everybody got that right. Very good. Good. <laughs> I could go home now, but... <laughs> um, can we go on to the next? Yes. Okay. And um, the sample that was received in the laboratory for this particular individual showed a normal female karyotype. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the karyotypic depiction of the chromosomes. Um, we call these karyograms now, uh, largest to smallest chromosomes. Um, we look at a particular band resolution. The longer the chromosome, the more information that the cytogeneticist can uh, receive. 
and we would routinely examine 20 cells. That would be the standard analysis. So if we are unable to look at 20 cells, we may have that discussion with the clinician if there is an index of suspicion for a particular abnormality. We could then take that material that we've already processed for conventional cytogenetic analysis and perform fish studies on it and look for that particular abnormality if we only had a few dividing cells. So it's really important, again, to speak with the clinician and to the pathologist because they're going to provide us the diagnostic information and direct further testing for us. Great, thank you. And Rob, what if, a little bit more, if you speak a little bit more about the molecular studies in, that this patient had in, in general. So many um, labs are now moving forward to do, um, as we talked about, the essential genes which have to be assessed, but many are now testing more genes as part of a panel because the cost is coming down. It's now easier to do things all as a group rather than piecemeal, as we talked about, with adding on single genes. So this patient had a 76-gene panel done. I think that's typical in many places. Many, um, for AML, 50-gene panels, you know, sometimes 25-gene panels. That usually covers most of the important ones. Um, you could argue when you start going over 50 or your gain of what additional information you get is, is small in terms of the numbers of genes. And this shows the results. So um, there were NPM1, DNMT3A, and TET2 mutations. And then some of the other key genes we talked about that should be assessed, FLT3 um, were negative, CBPA was negative, um, KIT mutations were negative, no IDH mutations, and no KRAS mutations. So I think of course, there were other genes tested, but these are, I think, some of the pertinent negatives that we've included here. Great. Could we ask how many uh, institutions representing the audience are doing next generation sequencing? It'd be interesting to see what everyone's yeah. doing. Say that again. On all new AML cases. So could everyone raise their hand if you're doing next generation sequencing on all of your patients? How many are not? It's not it's not you know you're limited with uh, the basic three gene panel. Three. And I think that's something that What I genes are being done? FLT three and PM and FLT three and C B P Alpha. Okay. Uh, and you know, the evidence is evolving, yet it's not yet been adopted across the board. And I think that's something right. that, that's you know, you the folks VAs. need to make a strong statement about, um, uh, especially the pathologists, because it's not happening universally. Yeah, I mean, it is true. Your, your point is well taken, that those are the, those are the ones that, for which we have targets directed therapy. So you could argue, and we'll talk about this case, how important is it that we know the patient has a TET2 mutation or DNMT3A. Um, so uh, I think most centers do it. Um, people are always enthusiastic about new technology and, and certain centers are do it because they may have clinical trials with IDH inhibitors, for example, that may, uh, the patient may be eligible. But I think you're right, technically, in terms of the care of the patient, I think probably those three are the only three that you really need to help make clinical decisions outside the context of a trial. I think that's true. And to do the classification, to call it the, the type of AML it is, according to the WHO, that's true. Those are the only genes you need. RUNX1, again, has been added, but it's a provisional entity. So you could argue if you don't have it on there, it's still, it's still OK. It's only a provisional entity. But, but certainly not doing the other sequencing, I think, is, is, is acceptable in terms of, of giving the correct pathologic diagnosis. Um, so with that information, how would you stratify this patient's disease? Favorable, intermediate, adverse, or you're not yet sure? Um, okay. If I want to comment on this, I would have said I'm not sure. I'm going to tell you what the book says, what the guidelines says, but we all probably agree on that to some degree. Um, to summarize the case, this is um, normal chromosomes mutated, MPM1, uh, TET2 mutated, and DNMT3 
mutated. You probably did notice that P53 was not done, and that is important, especially in the patients above 70. But knowing that, that will make this, pa this patient more consistent with favorable um, outcome. The problem is, if you look at this, it ignores the fact that you have DNA P3A mutation, which in some data shows that maybe it has poor outcome. There's also some data showing that if you have two or more mutations, that does predict more poor outcome. Several papers. Now again, not big, not yet validated. So if you go by the simple classification, this is favorable, but age 70, several mutations, I would be definitely concerned that this is probably not a real favorable case. Great. Maybe I could also have you walk through the ELN um, and then to be followed by the NCCN risk stratification to help provide some broad strokes about yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just going to stand up because it's behind me. Would you? That's okay. Um, no, it's fine. So as you can see, we talked about them. Basically, the favorable ones are the ones that are defined either by molecular, by mutation, or by translocation, gene rearrangement. And that could be like by fish or by the G-banding. Sometimes you will do the fish if you suspect, you know, for example, in version 16. Uh, even the chromosome did not show it. So the favorable will be the 821 in version 16 and the mutated MPM1 without FLIP3. Having IDH with MPM1 is common. Does not usually change that favorable prognosis if you see it, even if you see two mutations. And then we have those very, very uncommon potential, which is the biallelic CBPA mutation. Now, I said that, but there's also caveats, like we talked about the kit mutation presence in, pa in patients with CBF, acute mild leukemia, it does predict higher chance of relapse. Now, other than that, it'll be either intermediate or adverse. You can look at adverse in several ways. Inversion three is adverse. Six, nine is usually adverse. There's some data in the pediatric, maybe without flip three mutation, it's not that bad, but as of now, it's considered to be adverse. And if you look at then after that, the 922 is a new addition to the WHO. That's why you'll see it almost everywhere coming on. And then the definitely the complex, the monosomal carrier type. And then you have the molecular data that's now making its way. And you can see the RUNCS one that we've talked about, the ASXL, which is a new one by the ELN, not yet by other guidelines. And definitely the P53, which is something you can sometimes see by, you know, if you have a deletion or definitely if you have mutation. They're not coming to be deleted at the beginning. And then you have the FLIP3 ITD high. And this is something new, and it's probably important that the FLIP3 mutated is now considered high. Allelic burden or allelic ratio is considered to be in the adverse, not into, into the intermediate. So the ELN changed, this is the ELN set 2017, changed from four to three. There were three, four, now back three. But it's, again, it's very viable based on the new data that we're all trying to understand. Um, I don't know if anybody else wanted to add anything. I just think it's worth pointing out, and as you get to the NCCN guidelines, that the um, oh mutated NPM1, even with a high FLT3 ITD, is considered intermediate, whereas with um, the NCCN, um, it's it, it, the, there are slight differences. I also wanted to ask uh, Anne Marie, with the P53, of course, we know is such an important gene, and it's almost always mutated in the context of an adverse or complex karyotype. If you have a normal karyotype, is it even net, does it ever occur? Do you get P53 mutation? Is it worth testing? Or you is need that to remember that cytogenetics will only give you presence or absence of P53. Right. So cytogenetics cannot provide that information about mutation. Right. So you really need to do a molecular study. In that but case. it's quite uncommon to have the it mutation if correct. you have a normal type. So, so. Um, and there, there is correct. some data in the monosomal karyotype and and the yes. complex karyotype with or without, yeah. and actually you lose some of that detrimental effect without the P53. Is there another comment? Nelly. Well, no. so commonly, it's minus five and minus seven. Right. 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 We've seen, I think we've seen only one case with a normal karyotype that a P53 mutation actually. So. Great, thank you. Um, what are the treatment options for this patient? I will ask you to choose one. <laughs> you guys couldn't even choose one last night. <laughs> <laughs> true, it's very true. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. Thank you. I'm going to see if it will allow me to show you what we chose. So maybe we could start talking, Marty? Yes. Are you going to talk, tell us about this? Yes, well, I'll make some comments. Um, in a way, this is actually very easy. <laughs> and in the same respect, it's impossible. And the reason it's easy, because the right answer should be a clinical trial. Every patient we all will agree should be on some clinical trial. That's a little bit of a cop-out, I agree. But that, I think, is the best answer is a clinical trial. But if one is trying to decide what, you don't have a clinical trial, uh, what, what is the best uh, option, I think there's no right answer. High dose cytarabine you can't administer to um, patients much over 60. So I would eliminate high dose ARC. Clofarabine uh, has fallen out of favor based on several uh, reasons. One is the recent uh, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group study, 2906, that compared clofarabine to standard induction chemotherapy in older adults and showed uh, was actually stopped early because of uh, an inferior outcome with clofarabine. So I wouldn't be enthusiastic about clofarabine. I think the choice here is between uh, standard induction, so-called standard induction chemotherapy, intensive chemotherapy, or a low-intensity approach such as azacitidine and decitabine. And I think it's a close call. On the one hand, the patients you could argue is only 70, and they have a normal karyotype, and they have a we think, arguably, as Arif said, a reasonably favorable genetic uh, finding. So that might encourage you to consider standard chemotherapy. On the other hand, you can argue, the first person can argue she's only 70. The second person could argue, well, she is 70. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so and, and someone might argue that um, she has some comorbidities. As Arif said, again, nothing prohibitive, but she does have hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, and you might predict she might have more trouble with conventional induction chemotherapy. This is an example where fortunately uh, clinicians will not be replaced by computers and we can't plug in age, past history, cytogenetics, molecular genetics and be told what to do. You have to see the patient, examine the patient, talk to the patient and make a decision. But I think there's, there's the, the choice between B and C as was, uh, 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 as is outlined here, yeah, some D. B and D. Big, I'm sorry, B and D. Um, you could uh, you could argue either way. Yeah, but I mean, commonly, like what we face usually when these patients are being admitted, for us, um, next generation sequencing takes about ten days to get the NPM one and the other results, which is very important for decision making, of course. But commonly, we already start treatment before this information is available, and that can change how you deal with that issue and how soon in other institutions you get themselves. That's right. We, we get, I don't know if, how common it is, but we don't, get, we don't wait 10 days. We get it back in about four days. The NPM1, we have protocols for IDH, so we, want, we always get the IDH, PLIT3, and NPM1 back within about four days, sometimes five, but always within five days at the most. And, and that isn't by the time you get the patient prepared and do the marrow and have a family conference, it's not all that long. But I think 10 days seems long to me. Do you know your method for NPM1? Are you doing it by NGS or by target attack? Do we repeat the question? No, Marty. Yeah. I, she didn't have a mic. I'm not sure uh, people heard the question. The question is, what's the technique at our institution for NPM1? Um, that may be PCR based. Yeah, I'm sure it's PCR based. So that's, that's what I was going to say and summarize. We are very lucky at this moment in time that we do some targeted mutation analysis for FLT3, NPM1, um, IDH that we get within a couple of days and then our larger panel comes back. And, and we are, are in the transition process, but our larger panel is still taking two to three weeks. Um, so. Yeah. I need that information. I'm not willing to give up the the ability to get a flip through results nearly immediately um, because of the need for targeted therapies. And another question is, I mean, what, not for this patient, but if it was like younger than 60 years old and you needed to use higher dose tanarubicin with DNMT3 mm -hmm. situation, so that, does it change your management? Okay. We use idarubicin, so for us it's basically easy. <laughs> Uh, your, your question is, uh, it's a good one, the fact that this patient had a DNMT3A, 
uh, would that encourage you to give uh, intensive chemotherapy because of data, I think from our institution actually, uh, partly from our institution, but partly from ECOG, that um, those patients respond better to high dose donorubicin if, if we're a younger patient. Um, if it's a younger patient, we would give up to age 65, we give 90 milligrams anyway. Um, and I, I'm not sure because the patient has DNMT3, that would encourage me to give 90. The fact that, that we give 90 and they have DNMT3A may predict for a better response. The one thing we did at Mayo, because that's a very important question, is we run the NGS, it takes 14 days, so we're a bit slower than others, but we run the FLIP3 Sanger. So the Sanger will give us the results in three days. It's a bit, unfortunately, of duplicate of cost, but um, because of the, now the milestone is approved, so you don't want to wait right. 10, 14 days, you want to get them going. So this is how we do it until we figure out a way to make our NGS faster. Mm -hmm. And another thing is like in the absence of Swedish data before, like we used to be a little careful with older patients giving same plus free induction. In absence of clinical trial, we use it up to age 75 because we consider transplant for this patient. Not necessarily a PM1 and that's a questionable thing, but so that also matters. You know which study I'm talking about, the Swedish. I, I didn't, I didn't no, hear can you, you speak up, Nelly? You hold the no, microphone uh, closer uh, to closer your mouth. Sure. So I mean with Swedish data, large analysis that they did and offered induction chemotherapy for older people and they included up to age 85, mm -hmm. showing overall survival benefit. So we started offering induction treatment for older patients more nowadays than we used to do that in the absence of clinical trial. So I think, I mean, in this situation, if clinical trial wasn't there, I definitely would offer this lady cytarabin uh, and uh, anthracycline-based treatment. No, it's interesting. You're, I'll make some comments, and then Jessica and Arif can also comment. Yeah, I think you're referring to the study by uh, Juliusson mm -hmm. in blood. Yes. The Swedish group has this fantastic database where every patient in almost the whole country, there's a couple of areas of the country that are not required or participating, but almost every single patient with AML is recorded. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be fantastic yes. if we had such, a, such, a, such an endeavor here? Um, and it, it is true that that study suggested that patients up to 80 or so uh, had a survival outcome. I'm not sure. In fact, I think that the move is actually in the opposite direction. I think that the move, the thrust in the, in the AML community is to try to avoid and not give intensive chemotherapy to older adults, much over 75, for example. Not that they can't or it's not right, but I think that they're, in general, but not with that study notwithstanding, in general, patients, older adults, tend to have in, uh, unfavorable cytogenetics, molecular genetics, P53, complex karyotype, monosomal karyotype. And I think that, that the move is away from that toward more targeted therapy, or of course, very popular now is the um, hypomethylating agents. So we and others, I think, we, we try not to, we look for a reason not to give older adults intensive chemotherapy. I mean, when you look at, at many other studies, again, not that registry study from Sweden, uh, the outcome is really poor uh, for older adults, as you know. So I think there's a big move toward hypomethylating agents. I'm curious if we, I know we're running, if, I'm curious to have maybe one or two people. Uh, uh, what about people that argued for um, hypomethylating agent? What are your thoughts? We heard some thoughts about why intensive chemotherapy. I might well have chosen inten uh, non-intensive chemotherapy myself. I'm curious who, who, who would give a hypomethylating agent and why? Over here. Would you want to wait for the mic just a second, please, so we're not here? Thank you. TET2 is a good uh, theranostic marker, if you will, for response to hypomethylating, so. Great point. Good point. I would agree also with Martin. I mean, we're also moving more to the low intensity. I mean, I mean, if you think of it, there are several things. I mean, with all respect, that's a European study. Uh, maybe their health is different from us. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we, we see this in practice every day, you know, it's a 10 comorbidities, you're not going to offer them that chemo. The second thing is you probably need the patient, the patient has to be active in making that decision. The way we do it, we give the options like we did here. I would probably have said in this case, yes, I prefer the chemo, but I give the option for the patient. You pick, if you get, do you want to spend six months of those 10 months or 12 months in the hospital? Well, when you put it that way. <laughs> But that's, tr that's reality. <laughs> I mean, that's reality. Yes. 
This, I'm talking about this patient. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this patient 70 plus without transplant is not curable. So, yeah. I mean, crap, without a transplant. Sorry. So without a transplant, you, the patient has to be involved in that decision. I think it's a very important decision, and I agree with Martin. I mean, you've seen all these kind of side effects, and then the question is the patient gets crashed and stops, does not want to treat, continue the therapy. And you've seen, we've seen dysatabine is studying patients on it for two years, three years. I have a patient of six years. I mean, it's not common, but it does happen. So there is no upper age limit for transplantation, but what's really important is fitness. And maybe we can take a look at that Wonderful. next slide to, to talk about what factors do you think provide the best estimate of fitness for therapy? Perfect. So I'll turn to all of you. What factors do you think provide the best estimate of fitness? to comment as we're pulling up the answer. Um, so I, I think you know one of the one of the big take homes from all all of these concepts is that there are so many advances with cytogenetic and molecular studies and as we'll talk about later in the day emerging therapies that um, age really does not need to be the primary determinant in, in um, considering appropriateness for care um, and there's really no cut and dry black and white you have this, this is your treatment. It very much depends on cytogenetic results and where they fit along that, um, the trajectory of um, poor prognosis or uh, you know, to um, you know, advanced risk. So um, as we can see, we're kind of you know, all over the, the board here. I think all of these very much play into um, our decision for how we will treat this patient. Um, very much need to consider performance status, um, you know, kind of, and like you said, you know, kind of not maybe the second they walk in the door, but w what was their functioning level before they got sick that they might have the potential to return to? Um, comorbidity burden. We've said several times this patient had some comorbidities, but nothing that might be um, limiting. But so all of this lends itself to this is very much patient specific and, and case by case. Um, there are some scales that can, you know, might have some relatedness to help make these decisions in terms of, you know, comorbidity scales and things like that. Um, but, you know, and as, as you said, I, I think I would argue the, the one thing missing from here is very much patient preference. And it's, it's I think, incumbent upon all of us um, with all interdisciplinary roles to make sure that the patients have the information they need to make that preference an educated one. Um, and so, you know, really, I think we're, we're in a great place with AML diagnosis and treatment right now and, and making some, some great advances that all of these things really do um, can play into prognosis and, and overall outcomes. Just as an example, this was what her, this patient's fitness assessment was predicted to be. Um, not, not so bad. But importantly, also social support right. is, is something that we all need to think about with our, with our patients. Exactly. So it really is kind of combined, but I think we think about activities of daily living, mobility, exercise, and cognition, a normal three-word recall, something that's very simple that can be done at bedside. Wonderful. So I'll turn to, to Marty to just summarize the treatment discussion that he would be having um, with this patient. Well, again, I think the treatment uh, the, the three bullets here are, are important. First of all, again, I can't emphasize enough, I hope everyone agrees that we think that all patients should participate in some clinical trial so that we can give them the optimal therapy and we can make progress in the disease. And then beyond that, the decision comes to really one of uh, standard intensive chemotherapy or low dose, low intensity chemotherapy with a hypomethylating agent or what is very popular today, particularly, again, in the context of a clinical trial, are hypomethylene agents plus a novel agent, such as venetoclax or other agents. Um, and I think this, this is the decision, of, and, and there's no absolute right or wrong decision. It's a uh, decision that has to be made carefully, seeing the patient, examining the patient, and talking to the patient and the patient's family. So I think there's no right or wrong here. It sounds like most people here would argue for intensive chemotherapy, which I think is reasonable. Um, this is the initial therapy. I think time will preclude a lengthy discussion, but we've touched upon the issue of transplant, which um, 
uh, is likely in an older adult the only, the only reliable curative strategy. But of course, it's associated with certain morbidity and risk of mortality, which I think is, is, is less than it used to be, but I think it's not zero or, or 5%. So that has to be taken into account. It's possible some patients with, with enough morbidity will actually live longer and happier uh, with uh, one, two, or three years of hypomethylating agent or subsequent studies and subsequent therapy after that. Um, but I think most, the thrust in the field now is to try to do what you can to get a patient in first remission and then certainly at age 70, and this patient doesn't have say, many prohibitive uh, comorbidities to try to move to some kind of an allograft. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and Katie, if you, you could mm -hmm. go through just comments on reducing risk of yeah. treatment-related complications. Yeah, so, I mean, certainly lots of great treatment options, but then once we do go down that road, we have to be, you know, ready to try to optimize outcomes and, and make sure that the patient's able to get all of the intended dosing so, you know, <coughs> we're not needing to face those dose-limiting toxicities. And some of the most common ones we can see, especially with these um, highly intensive therapies, um, deconditioning and, and mucositis and make sure we know kind of what's our threshold for parenteral nutrition and trying to optimize oral intake um, certainly nausea and vomiting and making sure that we're following the NCCN guidelines for antiemetic um, prophylaxis and then certainly infection with this population and uh, you know do we have the right prophylactic antimicrobials on board and making sure that we're following neutropenic guidelines and um, you know starting those broad-spectrum antibiotics it's, you know, that first sign of fever. Um, but so the, these are certainly the most common of the dose-limiting lo dose toxicities that we'll see, especially with these intensive treatments. Um, and so, you know, just making sure that we're staying on top of assessment and, and early intervention for these patients. And I want to add that if you were at ASCO this year, one of the plenary session presentations was about showing four or five months survival benefit by enrolling in exactly what Kathleen said. Standard chemo, one, half, half the patients got online, almost 80 day access to send their symptoms and manage it versus not. Survival was better four months than that. So I, I hope that we will be doing something similar to that in AML too. <coughs> All right. That concludes the formal tumor board. There is now the opportunity for a break and we'd like you to move into your breakout sessions, which we will direct you. But if there are questions as we're wrapping up, please feel free to ask us. Thank you all for your participation.